Hello, and welcome back to Brave Nation. This is a podcast where we have brave conversations. And as some of you know, uh, if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, one of my passions is about school choice. I have a very personal reason why I engage in school choice. And, uh, you know, how it started for me was we, my friend and I had had this event and we were actually trying to uh, serve homeschool students. My, my friend was like, we need to have something for homeschool students. And I, and I was like, you know what, let's, let's expand further than that. Like, let's think bigger picture and think about serving all students in our area and all families in our area. So I was like, you know, I'm super passionate about school choice. And as the more I explained what it, what it was, she was like, yeah, let's do this. And so we made it a school choice event. Um, and we just did it by our own bootstraps. We, we, uh, had this conference sort of kind of event and it was really well received in the community. And, and then school choice week reached out to me and they were like, can we help you with this? And we, I was like, of course, let's do this. And I just learned more about School Choice Week and what it is. And it's a great organization. And they're they're there to help, help people understand, help families understand what school choice is all about. And so um, without further ado, I want to introduce you to our lovely guests that we have here today. And I was able to go to the partner exchange um, over in Chicago that they invited us to all of all of the people that do these school choice events. And so I met these two ladies and I thought I really want their perspective on our podcast today. So today we have Chrystia Campos Spivi, director of Conoce Tus Opciones Escolares, which is a project of National School Choice Awareness Foundation. I hope I pronounced all that correctly. My four years of Spanish. <laughs> um, and then we have Seanette Parker, Director of Awareness Events at the National School Choice Awareness Foundation. And so I just wanted to introduce you guys to our audience and just tell us a little bit about your background and what what role do you play in advocating for school choice? And let's start with Chrissy. Chrissy? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you for having us. Um, mm -hmm. It's really a pleasure to talk to you and everybody that's listening to this podcast. Well, my background, uh, I'm originally from El Salvador. I moved to the U.S. in 2009. So I think it's been a while uh, since I've been here. Living in North Carolina currently. Well, I always live in North Carolina in the U.S. Um, my background uh, professionally is I work I, I work with public relations and I do a lot of visual stuff with graphic and stuff like that. And I always love working for nonprofits. I always prefer working for an idea rather than a product. And about six, five, six years ago, I came across National School Choice Week. They had an opening and it was just perfect for me. Um, I started working with them um, since since then, uh, working in general uh, during National School Choice Week and all year long, and hearing all the conversations that parents had, that other people have, that you know, educators and people that actually get to make uh, the law for all of this, and it was just so interesting um, learning that everybody has questions, everybody has thoughts, and I think what we started saying is that these thoughts. These questions were somewhat magnified uh, with Hispanic communities, especially Spanish speaking communities. Um, and from there, kind of like the project uh, was thought and was launched and it's been a pleasure. It's been over a year since we officially launched and we've been talking to thousands of individual parents looking for school choice options all over the country in Spanish. So it's been yeah. really fun. And yeah, I, I did read that, that that um, Hispanic communities actually lead the way in in support of school choice options for their families. They're really um, they're really engaged in that that movement. And so I'm just so excited that that we're getting those Spanish speaking um, opportunities. And, and like I came from the L.A. Unified Public School System. And so Spanish was a huge deal. I my I learned some words <laughs> um, out on the playground. <laughs> Um, Gallete and Andale were the two words that I learned. <laughs> Those are good to know. Those are good to know. And uh, very necessary. Uh, up and shut up. So that's <laughs> anyway. So, um, Seanette, uh, tell us about your role. Yes. 
Yes, well, thank you for having me on. I always am excited for an opportunity to talk about school choice. So um, my background, I guess, first is, is in psychology and education. So professionally, I'm also a psychology professor. So I've taught in higher ed for several years, um, although I started in K through 12 education. Um, and then I worked, kind of came onto the school choice movement. I had started helping open charter schools when I was in Indianapolis. I'm originally from Indiana. And then I moved to South Carolina about 13 years ago, and I had a wonderful opportunity to start with the Public Charter School Alliance of South Carolina. And so that kind of started my association with it here. Um, even though I had come from just this background, a small school movement, working with big picture learning, working with the Association for High School Innovation. And so I'd done a lot of that. And so I was excited for an opportunity to really sink my teeth into it in um, the South Carolina education landscape. And was able to start a nonprofit, really just about parent advocacy, my, edu my education, and where we were just trying to connect parents with all of the education options that they had in South Carolina. And so that's where I got my connection with the National School Choice Awareness Foundation was I was one of the partners. So for about 10 years, I had been running our big flagship events, whether it was a school fair or a capital celebration, um, movie screenings, and being able to just really make sure parents in this area knew about their options. And so I'm excited now that I get to serve as the director of awareness events for the National School Choice Awareness Foundation. And so not only am I helping with the South Carolina big celebration for National School Choice Week, but I also get to help our partners. And so I'm supporting about 17 other events across the country. So it's it's been exciting for me to continue along this path and be connected to the work. Yeah. Well, I realize that some people might not know what school choice is. So yes. Shawnette, how would you... Uh, how would you define school choice? Yeah, well, and I always like to separate that. I'm glad you're asking that question. First, we all have school choice, right? I, I think that's where sometimes we get hung up on this question and people think that it's something to be in opposition toward and it's not. As a parent, we all are making decisions for where we want to send our children. Even when we choose to send them to the zoned district school, that's still our choice, right? You're still being presented and saying, this is the school that you've been zoned for, and now you get to come here. We kind of tend not to think it's a choice because you're like, they told me I had to go to that school. Mm -hmm. But technically, we're actively as parents making that choice to go to that school. I think, too, then, as we grow into the space where we're getting more legislation around school choice, we're starting to use that phrase synonymously, but then there's this distinction between programs that help support parents' ability to make choices. So then you start having like the tax credit scholarships and the education scholarship accounts or education savings accounts. I know different states are calling them different things. That's what I consider to be a different level of school choice so that we have these programs that are supporting our ability to make the decision, give us access to the different options. But school choice in itself is just a parent saying, where is the best place to educate my child? And they may decide it's better for me to keep them home and to do homeschooling or to enroll them in a co-op or to go to a micro school or to go to a private school or a charter school or traditional public or magnet. That in itself is choice when parents make that decision. So I really like to hone in on that. And so we don't get tied up into thinking that uh, funding structure is choice itself. That's a way to help us access the choice. Sure. And, and the reality is that, that we all have choice to the extent that our funding allows us <laughs> to have choice. So, you know, right. lower income families have fewer choices, naturally speaking, than do more affluent families. And so that's why we're advocating for school choice in the sense that those lower income families can get the help they need to have all the options available to them that other families get. Is, would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yes. And uh, so I want to ask you guys, um, what motivates you personally to advocate for school choice all over the country? And let's go ahead and go to Chrystia. Yeah, um, I think one of the first things that for me, school choice, the action of, you know, the exercise and the philosophy of school choice was somewhat foreign. Uh, where I come from and a lot of Hispanic people that are first generations like me, uh, we have two options. Either you go to the um, public school or you go to a private school. So there wasn't much more than that. So the idea of having 
more options was super interesting. And I have twins. Uh, they're 13 years old boys. And it's funny because when I was pregnant and from the first moment I find out that I was going to have twins, it was very important for me to just not give one more than the other one. So I, did, I didn't want anybody to feel like one was loved more than the other one. But it's funny because over the years, uh, the same household, obviously the same parents, um, the same everything. I used to even buy the same clothes for those kids. And then over the years, you see how different they were, that it didn't matter how equal I tried to make everything in my house. Everybody's different, you know, and I saw it firsthand. And when... Um, I started learning about school choice, uh, being in this world. I mean, it just makes sense personally. Like I said, my two kids did exactly the same thing. They're opposite, completely opposite in, in their interests uh, and everything that has to do with, um, with their own personality. So it just makes sense for me personally that school choices make sense for families that, and all of that. But then in the other side, because my background, because I know what it is to not know and to be somewhat lost. I know it's very difficult even for families that have been here for generations. I mean, we all have questions and I know, like I say, these questions were magnified and the um, Hispanic uh, population. So just knowing that with the work, people are getting information, are making decisions that truly impact their families and in, in the mi microwave, but also impacting society in big, this country that adopted me, uh, you know, making this country also better is actually really impactful and has a lot of meaning to me. So yeah. that's the reason why yeah. I, I really and, like And I think, me. you know, second generation or, you know, first generation Americans, you know, people who are coming into this country, they don't always have the tools to actually teach their kids in that language and to know all the things about our country that they need to know. So school choice, I would think would, it would impact them hugely. Um, in, in opening up those doors uh, because, you know, a lot of us can help. Maybe we feel like we have the capability of homeschooling, but not every family does. So, yeah. And then Seanette, what, why do you do this? Yeah. So I, I'm a child of the, what, I guess the eighties, nineties, you know, remember we grew up in that, the PSAs that would say knowledge is power and that type of thing. And they were all of the after school specials and why it was so important to get an education Although I saw that, I think for me growing up as a Black woman in the United States, my experiences told me that having a good education is what was going to decrease that gap. Um, and, and seeing how much further my education could take me when it came to employability and all those things. And that was true. And, and as I set out on that path through higher ed and got my PhD, I knew that it was increasing my chances to be successful. And so I just want to share that with everyone else. I see how important a good education is. And I see what happens in neighborhoods and communities where they don't have access to the best resources and things like that. I grew up, I'm a first generation college kid. Um, you know, I should be a statistic, but I saw what getting a good education did for me and how it helped shift my position in society. And that's really what motivates me is because I want everyone to at least have access to that and have that opportunity. And in particular, it's really important for families of color if we really want to be able to um, decrease this achievement gap. And so that's been my big mission is to say, look, you know, there's so much for you out there as long as you can get a good education. Yeah. And both of you mentioned your culture and where, you know, your people, where you come from. And, um, and that's, that's a really important take on this. And that's kind of why I invited you guys here, because I think people need to hear um, from these different people groups, even different demographics, like socioeconomic status, those type of things. Um, what I see it as is really lifting people out of poverty because, um, you know, there's, there's those chains of poverty. And like you said, education is, is the way to move people out uh, of those, you know, cycles. Um, and so, you know, if we just make a door open for people, they will walk through it. I have actually had, I've had pushback on this a few times from people where they've actually said, you know, the people like those people, you know, the people that are in poverty, they won't make that choice. And, and that, that was so frustrating to me because, you know, I've been there. And um, of course, my mom got a she got a job in a another school that was better for me. Um, and that was the only way I could go there. But I knew that just because my mom got a job 
um, you know, that was the way I could get there, but not every kid could get there, you know? And so uh, it's, it's just so important. How would you address that? You know, somebody just saying, like they won't make that choice. <laughs> um, and and often, but there is a little bit of truth to that because often they don't make those choices. So what are some of the barriers that you're seeing and just anything related to that? Who wants to jump in on that? <laughs> I'd love to jump in, oh. if that's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts on that. Uh, first, I love to always refer to data. Um, and I, we have a lot of that in National School Choice Awareness Foundation. And one of the things that we have found, A, is that in our own research with a lot of national surveying parents, we have found that Hispanic parents are actually the ones that like school choice, the idea of a school choice, the opportunity, the exercise of school choice, that, that immediately uh, is, it has something to say that we're actually interested on this. Uh, another thing that I can say about, especially with right now, charter schools nationally are growing. National uh, Charter school and homeschooling are booming right now. And particularly for charter schools, uh, they change and the growth is being led by Hispanic people, by Hispanic families. So Hispanic families are actively making decisions uh, with different school choice type. And the third thing that I will say with data on that as well, I will say that unfortunately, Hispanic families, Hispanic students are the ones that are coming the lowest in just about every metric. Um, the NAP, NAP, sorry, is um, I'm gonna get you the, the, uh, the research in that, but um, we actually, they say they, they want in the, the report card, the national report card uh, research that they do, uh, these years say that Hispanic students in second grade are actually, in fourth grade, I'm sorry, are actually two years behind um, in reading in English. And that's the lowest of any demographic group. So I think when parents feel and see that problematic uh, statistic, they feel it at their home, they see that their children are not having the academic success that we all want, right? And that immediately pushes us to look for options. I mean, we have no options if our kids are not having success, we have to look for other other options. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and if I can add to that, I, you know, I get so frustrated when people say, oh, certain parents just don't care and they don't, they're not there to support their kids and they're not making a choice. I had a really combative situation with a uh, state representative here in South Carolina and he tried to make that claim. The thing is, and, and in particular, I'll speak somewhat for, you know, black community families that I've come across, they're making the choice. They want something different. The big barrier becomes being able to access those things, Absolutely. right? When it's like, when they do find a school, say even a charter school that's going to work better for their child, but then that charter school doesn't provide transportation. And that might be the reason why they can't go because there's a transportation barrier, or they find a great private school that they'd like to attend, but then it costs too much. And they're doing everything that they can to sacrifice for that, but they can't make that decision to go there. So then they become stuck. I think I'm seeing more and more families want to make a different decision. They're trying something, but then there's other barriers to that. And so it gets really frustrating. People say, oh, they probably won't make that decision or, oh, they don't care. And I'm like, you just don't know enough about the families and, you know, what they're up against. And so then when you don't see certain families in schools or certain parents attending PTO meetings and things like that, you assume it's because they don't care when mm -hmm. they care a whole lot. They just have other things that become a priority. Right. And I think it's really interesting that, that the same argument that I think should move people towards school choice move people away from school choice. Like, the, you know, the, the, the school choice distractors say, you know, well, there's no busing. Well, then that's a problem we need to solve, you know, like that, that's an access issue we actually need to move towards solving so that they can have greater choices, not just to eliminate it and say, well, because we don't have that, you know, they shouldn't have a choice. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. So that, mm -hmm. that's really, I, I just now occurred to me, that's really ironic there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so it's like, take away the barrier, you would have something to stand on. If all of the opportunity was there that you say, hey, we have the buses for we have all these things. And then if people aren't making the choice, then I could see people having an argument. But no, if you had in a, in a perfect situation to where everyone had equal access to all of these opportunities, I can guarantee you, just like Christina said, I mean, there's a lot of Hispanic families at, who are leading the way when it makes, making those choices. And I know that in, you know, black community and other communities of color, people are making the choice, even, and if we even look at it from an economic standpoint, 
lower income families want something different. They just can't access it. So until you level the playing field, I don't want to hear it from me personally, that argument that, oh, they're not making that choice because I just don't believe it. Yeah. And really what you're saying, if you, if you take away choices from the low income families, I think what you're saying is that only high income families deserve to have this kind of education. (laughs) And and that's that's a strong, you know, nobody wants to say that out loud, but that's essentially what you're doing. Um, So speak directly, you started to talk a little bit about it, but speak directly to your communities and what specific issues that you're seeing um, and maybe some barriers and, you know, how you're able to make inroads with, with your community. Well, here in South Carolina, um, you you know, one of the big issues is just a communication thing and making sure that the information trickles down to all communities. Unfortunately, so much of the education choice conversation has been polarized by uh, um, politics, you know, and so if the message is coming from, you know, Republicans and you have a certain population that closes their ears to it and vice versa, And, and we know here in South Carolina, at least, it's largely a Republican state. This, a lot of the decisions are being made in terms of our education changes and things like that. And so then you'll have certain communities who don't listen and they feel like it's not for us. And so we just don't infiltrate different communities enough and we don't have enough people at the table talking about this, like diverse individuals. This is why I'm so passionate about being a part of the conversation because I know that I can get people to kind of listen and say, hey, no, I think you have it wrong. I know that on the surface, it doesn't appear that this is a program for you, but it is for you. So for it's been my experience that a lot of it comes down to people just not feeling like they are welcome in specific spaces. Mm-hmm. And so we're having to find more and more messengers to share that message like this is also for you. You know, South Carolina just passed the Education Scholarship Trust Fund, which is our version of the ESA. And I've been trying to do a lot of grassroots work in terms of letting the community know these scholarships are for you and they're really tailored with you in mind, please don't ignore this. But then I hear people saying, oh, that's just that Republican thing. And that's for elite white families. That's not for us. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, how do we change the messaging around that? That's what I'm noticing is one of our big issues here. And I found that school choice in my mind is so, so much more uh, inclusive than other, uh, other thoughts. I know there is even some, I know it's, usually thought of as like a right wing thing or whatever, but there is actually pushback on the right to say that um, no, we should, that no government funding should go toward any of, any of this Mm -hmm. stuff. They're they're concerned about that. And there is a a valid concern that it could encroach on some of the freedoms um, of, of independent homeschoolers. But I, but I'm saying those don't have to be mutually exclusive independent homeschoolers should have their rights intact as well. And we shouldn't be forcing people to take the funds or even forcing schools to take the funds. But um, but we can be inclusive of the people that do need the funds. And I, I don't see it as as a thing that is necessarily divisive, but there there's both sides of the spectrum. And I feel like school choice is just saying, and, and your organization has done a great job of just saying, hey, let's include everyone. And public schools can even benefit from this. (laughs) So, you know, um, so Chrissy, go ahead and share about your, your culture and what, how you see it impacting you guys. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very similar to what Dr. Parker said. Um, Often our community don't see themselves as being able to participate in these opportunities. And it might not be in the same way as a Republican or a Democrat type of thing or right or left. I don't think we see that problem so much with the Hispanic community, but we do see um, they might hear something in the news, but they think, oh, that just, I just wouldn't be able to apply for something like this, or they don't see themselves in that, like um, like we just said before. Another thing is, uh, like what I say, the lack of, for the, especially for first generation, the lack of context that we often have, uh, lack of information that we have. I have had parents where there, um, there has been a student that is this is assigned to that school, but they tell them, well, we don't have the resources to um, have everything we need for your special need child, so you cannot come here. And then it is that lack of information to say, well, wait a minute, that actually is not true. I my child should have ex- access to to this education in this school, or you know, even access to school choice. So I think we have a little bit of that. We're obviously trying very hard to 
close that cap of information to provide that information in the language that parents, uh, the Hispanic speaking Spanish speaking parents need. That's one thing, and it's funny what you were what you were saying uh, about that level of you know like democrat parents and republican parents but we actually did a survey here and there or in the foundation and we actually found that school choice at least when it comes to parents making choice is not partisan so mm -hmm. we asked a lot of parents like 2000 and more parents uh, across the nation and 56 percent of democrat or parents that identify themselves as democrat they chose a school in the last year versus 40% of parents that identify themselves as Republican. So we do have that idea. I think that is very abstract, but in the practical level, we all want school choice. We all, we all want what's best for our children, right? Mm -hmm. uh, regardless of who you identify with politically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it really, you know, we're seeing so much vitriol in, in public schools these days with it seems like there's an arm wrestling match over like values and politics and all of this stuff. And to me, you know, school choice isn't dictating what values you want your family to hold, what values you're, you you want to um, portray to your kids. It's just saying you get to vote with your feet. <laughs> you get to make that decision yourself. And and to me, yeah, I, I would think everyone would want that. <laughs> so um, any other... Uh, um, Actually, let me let me talk about the the faith, like, you know, people who grow up in, in different faith traditions. How are they? Have you noticed um, anything in particular about about that demographic? For us, I mean, it, I think a lot of people who go to like private schools and their private Christian schools, they're excited about being able to have the choice. I know here in South Carolina, when the ESA or the Education Scholarship Trust Fund passed, I did hear quite a few in the faith based community excited about not necessarily in a way that I wanted them to be but excited because they're like yes I get to choose where to send my child to keep them away from some of the negative things that are happening in society I personally don't have that viewpoint like let's shield kids but I get it like I understand when there's a lot of scary things that are happening and if it does go against your religious beliefs that is one of the beauties of having options and being able to choose where you want to go because you can keep your children in like-minded environments. I mean, I'm probably a little bit more liberal with my thinking. I like to address things head on and say, we just need to create spaces to talk about these things. But I'm okay with that. If that's what a parent's choice is saying, I'm happy that I have choice to be able to move them out of that space and then I can talk to them about these things as they come about. So for me, that's what I've heard more of is just people saying, this is great that we have an opportunity to, I guess, exercise our religion more, lean further into the um, just having Christian schools. And I've also heard more conversations about building more private schools. That's one of the ways that we were able to fight more for our ESA here is that we connected with pastors in the faith-based community. And really we're trying to talk about if something like this were to pass, perhaps you might consider opening a private school because a lot of the opponents were saying, well, hey, even if we get this thing passed, we don't have enough private school choices in say particular rural areas. And so part of what we were also trying to do when I was with the other nonprofit was saying, okay, at the same time that we're making access to the scholarship, we're gonna work on growth of schools. So that's where I've had a lot of connection with folks within the faith-based community say, how can you continue to build more of your schools as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, similar to what Dr. Parker says, um, I am my kids go to traditional public school. I have absolutely nothing against traditional public school that has worked for me, for my family. But I do think, I mean, we sh every parent should have the decision to say, this is, these are our values, this is what's important for us, and this is where we want our children to go to. Uh, a lot of the schools that participate during National School Choice Week are faith-based, but also we have a lot of different, including like 15% of traditional public school of the whole country that do participate during the week. Um, but yeah, I do think uh, who, who am I or anybody to say to a family, no, you shouldn't send your child or you shouldn't have any type of option when it comes to religion or anything like that. I said similarly 
to it's just a cultural preference it's just something for a lot of hispanic families it's important to continue with the language so a lot of families that speak spanish one like spanish immersion or like a bilingual or dual language uh, school that normally doesn't happen in a, in a traditional public school it will happen most likely in a charter school um, or in a magnet school or a private school so it's a preference of the family and i don't think anybody other than the family, should be able to decide what works best for them. And every culture has its own value system, its own, you know, it's just, it's a huge ball of wax that comes with having a culture. And we have a lot of Samoan, Samoans population in our area. And so uh, when we explored the possibility of maybe having some Samoan speaking classes, you know, they were trying to preserve some of their cultural aspects. And that became really exciting for them because, you know, in, in our area, they they struggle in in some in some of the traditional mindsets, but then they also want to access you know the sports and the different things like that, and and we're trying to make that happen and and really educate them and let them know, okay, this is available to you, but you can still be involved in sports, you can still do other things, but you can also have a, an alternative way to learn. If that's not working for you, you can try something else. And I think most of it for us, and especially me living here on the east side in Anchorage, um, we have we have one of the most we have the most diverse high school in the nation. Um, many many languages being spoken. We have Hmong, we have Samoan, all these different languages and everything. Um, but a lot of the parents don't know about school choice. Like I think that's why we started doing these events was because they're like, what it, what even is school choice? And so, and then I started a small, uh, hybrid, uh, school out here. It's not really a school. It's more of like a learning community. <laughs> um, but we started that just because there weren't, there just weren't the options. But I think when you start, um, you know, putting the funding toward different things that, that the community supplies the need, the supplies, um, the answer for that need, that's just kind of what, how, uh, how free economics works, right? <laughs> we supply uh, what what the need is there. So, and and I think the importance is um, um making access, you know, getting getting the um the transportation, getting the after school and before school care. Those type of things will help more students access that. And that's currently what we're exploring here in Alaska. Some of those things just come from the state, you know, um, asking the governor, like, can we get these little things um, to, to help these students get access to all the things that are already available to them and then get the word out to them about these different things. How, how has got, getting the word out been, a, been a, a challenge and how have you kind of overcome that? So you're saying just in our specific community, getting the word out? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, it a it's gotten a lot better here, specifically in South Carolina, just because of National School Choice Week and National School Choice Awareness Foundation and all of the resources connected to that and being able to connect with different partners throughout the country. But in South Carolina, um, you know, the challenge often is who the messenger is. And so for me, as a leader, I guess, in this work and, and being an advocate in school choice, I try to connect with people from different walks of life to kind of create these ambassadors of sorts. I know when I was running the local nonprofit here at MIC Education, I even call them education choice ambassadors because I saw a need, like I know I can move within a lot of different communities and people will listen to me, but then there were some spaces that I won't say that I couldn't go, but that I might not, not have been received as well. And, and that's true for some of my colleagues. And so we started to kind of create these strategies where we kind of divide and conquer, or we know that you know, certain faces and people and backgrounds can get into certain spaces. So, you know, I'm of the Baptist faith and I work a lot with pastors. So I was able to go to one of their conventions where one of my colleagues was not. And so they were able to do certain things. So we have to work within coalitions um, and try to help and say, ultimately, we all have a similar goal. We're all working toward the same thing. We might not agree on everything, but if this is the one issue that we can agree on, how can we build strategies around that? So I think that's what's been successful here. Um, so if anything, it's like that's a message I'd want to get out to people. If you're struggling in your community, see who you can partner with. Um, who you might not align with everything, but if it's that one thing, you will be able to cover so much more ground in terms of just communicating what this school choice thing really is about. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, for us, I, I think in the Hispanic community, the biggest challenge was, um, well, first of all, a lot of the challenge, I wouldn't say the biggest challenge, but a lot of the challenge was language, right? So we were very fortunate here in the foundation to have so many resources uh, of information. We keep track of all the changes that are happening in every state. So we pretty much mimic that in Spanish. So the information was there. We tried to do what we tried to do is just not translate it, but to make it relevant to the questions that parents are asking us. Uh, we wanted to find parents where they were. And I know for us, it was Hispanic parents really love to be online. Uh, they love Facebook, they love WhatsApp, they love Instagram. So we put a lot of our efforts in there and it actually paid quite a bit. Um, a lot of the other things that we found is that parents, most of the, they're talking to us one-to-one -one in, uh, in messengers, in WhatsApp messages. And what we hear is that they want to be, what we we don't hear. What we sense is that they want to just be heard. And I think once they feel heard, understood, they see that there's a person there mm -hmm. putting the information out there is really, you build that trust. You build that uh, bigger connection that we want to create with parents. And ultimately, like Dr. Park has said as well, creating those connections with other organizations. As I work, as we work nationally, uh, we have built uh, connections with organizations that don't necessarily work with education, but do work with Hispanic families to be a channel uh, to rely, to bring that information to the parents that really, really need it. So those have been some of the challenges that we have found. Sometimes we have a lot of information, but maybe not a lot of the people that we want are getting them. So we create these connections with organizations everywhere uh, that are talking to families. That's really good. And I know that you guys are working on more of a database, right, with your website so that people can go there and they can find the options that are available to them. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, we do it in English and Spanish. Uh, what we do is every state, if you visit schoolchoiceweek.com slash and whatever the state is, we have information, the most updated, the most unbiased, the more practical, jargon-free information that you will find in the internet on all the school choice. When we talk about school choice, like you say, we're talking about traditional public school and even open enrollment within their uh, public charter school, public magnet, online school, private schools, homeschooling, and now we even have a guide on microschooling. So all 50 states, uh, that happens in schoolchoiceweek.com, and then we do very similar work in opcionesescolares.com. Yeah, I appreciate you guys adding yeah. the schooling thing in there. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add to that, too. And if someone visits our website and you can't find the information, we're really responsive. Send us an email, ask the question, and we will find the answer. Because we have so many connections with wonderful partners out there like yourself that we're doing this great work with. So even if we haven't found that yet, we will find that local person within that state to get that question answered. So we never want anyone to just go away from our website and say, oh, they didn't have the answer. I don't know what else to do. Ask. And we will definitely be able to do our best to find the answer for yeah. you. Because this is a living document. This is a work in progress, right? Like everything yeah. I was thinking with our state, you know, we have a unique uh, way that we we fund these um, indirectly fund some of these educational opportunities. And so they're third parties. They're like, you know, you you have a charter school that then will fund um, individual teachers and individual things like that. So so the the micro schools or the learning pods or those types of things are kind of hard to find. There's like no one place that you can search all those and they're constantly changing. <laughs> so, um, but that that's really the challenge for us, I think, is just to have that database. So we are creating um, a school choice coalition to try to help, you know, all throughout the year, first of all, discover, you know, what kind of things we can do to move school choice forward in our state in particular, but then also how to get that access and that information out to families in Alaska as best we can. So we're we're just honored to partner with you guys. You do things really excellently. And our our I just want to tell you about our event. So I don't forget to tell you about that. It is alaskaschoolchoice.com. That's where you can look at all the information. We have a number of different speakers. We try to get a variety of speakers. Like we have parents, teachers from the public school, um, an administrator from the private school, um, just all the different things you could think of. Um, we have vendors. We have about 25 vendors that are coming to, um, you know, 
be hopefully be interactive, but also share what they do in our community. And then uh, we have some uh, a choir, at least one choir. We have a couple different performing um, opportunities that are happening uh, while the vendors are open. So there's just going to be a lot of fun. There's going to be food. And if you would like to order dinner there, there's going to be um, Garcia's Mexican restaurant is going to have dinner for purchase, but um, it's going to be a fun time. So it's going to be January 22nd from 4 to 7 p.m. at the Alaska Native Heritage Center, which is on the east side of Anchorage. So if you're coming in from the valley, you can uh, hop into that and hopefully it hopefully you can get there right after school and then just be there the whole time and ha and just hang out with your family. So any any final words you guys have? Um, just really honored to have you here. Oh, the event sounds mega fun. I wish I could go, but <laughs> we're going to be yeah. organizing 26,000 events and activities. So. Yeah. Uh, I just like to add uh, for every parent that is listening to this podcast, I just love to, we always talk about why we do National School Choice Week in January. And in the practical level is because it's the perfect time to start that research, uh, research uh, journey it is the perfect time that it will give families enough time to explore all their options, to do all the paperwork, to put place themselves in waiting lists if that's going to happen. But for this coming year, by the time is the new year, the new school year, by the end of, uh, of, of the summer, all should be ready uh, and just take advantage of this opportunity during National School Choice Week where everybody's talking about school choice. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess I would just like to say that uh, and remind parents, never feel bad about making a choice that you think is important for your child. You choosing to go somewhere other than the school that you've been zoned for is not you saying that you're against public schools or anything like that. You have every right to make the decision that's best for your child and you should never feel bad about that. And I guess I just want to say that out there to everybody who might be against this concept of school choices that we're school choice means all school options right it, it's public private homeschool virtual charter all of them that you can name um and so it's not about putting anybody down it's just saying that we just want what's best for children and and we just don't learn the same way so i just want parents to keep that in mind and don't feel bad about making a decision for your child yeah and that is a really good point and a really good way to end because I think about, you know, the camps that people get themselves into, like, I'm a homeschooler and you should only homeschool. Everyone should homeschool. Everyone should this or that. That's actually going by the wayside, I feel like. And, and a lot of, we're realizing that even, even as me, as a homeschooler, um, going through realizing I had to create a school just so my kids uh, could not be taught by me anymore because I realized that wasn't working for our family anymore. So even in the same family, you have different dynamics happening. And we're realizing that we don't need to um, come down hard and judge people for their choices. We just need to support each other as parents and as community members saying, hey, we support your your freedom and what's best for your family. And that's, that's where the heart of it is. It's supporting families. And I'm just honored to be a part of this. So thank you so much for all you do. Thank you so much. Thank it you. Was a pleasure. Okay. We'll talk to you later.